Hello, everybody. Kurt here. Um, I'm hoping everybody is safe and sound, and I'm assuming that you're all in your own homes. I'm not sure. I'm really grateful to have a chance to talk to you today. Um, I'm here. I've got about 45 minutes, and when I got this call about this opportunity, I was going to set up my house and do a haircut on a mannequin head. And I said, you know, I think if I was housebound, and particularly if I was a student, that maybe the most interesting thing I could try and understand would be uh, a little bit more about equipment and more importantly, a little bit more about how to use it. So um, what I'm hoping to do today is have kind of a, not a top line, but not a deep dive, somewhere in the middle. I would like to talk about combs. I would like to talk about scissors. I would like to talk about clippers. And with all of them, I would like to talk a little bit about the mechanics and um, some tips about the most effective way to use those tools. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna go with combs first. And my, my thing with combs is kind of, it's really personal with me. I am much more likely to do a good haircut if I have the right comb than if I have the right clip or the right scissor. Uh, combs are just incredibly important part of what we do. And I see people kind of not give them the attention they deserve or possibly working with combs that have got missing teeth or more often than not using the wrong comb for the job. And Horace used to teach us, I apprenticed under Horace, and my introduction said that I'd spent my whole life in uh, men, and I haven't. I, I'm licensed as a cosmetologist and a barber. And when I apprentice under Horace, he would tell us that combs to hairdressers are like paint brushes to artists, and that you should use the big brush for large amounts of real estate and little brushes for the specific little details. And with that, now that I'm in the men's business a lot, I have kind of found that is true. Um, a lot of people think that the little tiny tapered combs are the barbering combs, only for detail and finishing. So let me give you four kinds of combs, four kind of broad categories of combs, and then we will, uh, uh, possibly if you have some questions, I can read them here. But in men's haircutting, the first kind of comb is a flat top comb. It's the biggest comb. They're paddle shaped, they're usually flat. And the key with these combs is they're specifically designed to do the top of a flat top. So they're not traditionally clipper combs. They're for the top. You got a special grip you use on them or you lay them in your hand like this. They're great for doing flat tops, but a lot of people confuse these for clipper combs. And what makes them a little awkward for clipper combs is they usually have a really thick spine and they don't have the kind of flex or dexterity that you need to kind of get around bone structure. So they're good for flat tops. I would have one if you're gonna do the occasional flat top, but I don't know that I would use it for a clipper comb. So the second kind of comb we have is a clipper comb. And these combs you're gonna use much more of the time if you're doing men's haircutting. They have, uh, you know, they're big enough to kind of protect you from hitting the head. If you've got a clipper or cutting tool, they're, they're safe. They drop your blood pressure, but they have to have a lot of flex. And they want, you want a little bit of a thinner spine on the comb so that you just have more sensitivity to depress it into bone structure if, if you're trying to take out a shadow or a mark, having that, that amount of flex is an important thing. And the tooth count on these is generally standardized. Most people don't use a clipper comb with wide and fine teeth. They usually have one uh, tooth count, and that's the one you want to get used to. So that's your second comb. The third comb that I want to talk about is styling combs. And this is where it gets a little bit trickier. Um, I picked what I consider to be the three most popular styling combs in the market. And this is uh, the Wyas Parks comb. This is uh, 
oh, I don't even know who makes this comb. This is one Antoinette uses. And this is the uh, Sabon comb. And I have to tell you that they, they behave so totally differently. Um, this comb has a parting tooth. If you can see at the coarse tooth side, there, it looks like there's a broken tooth in it. And it's a really expensive comb. But that parting tooth is there to help you make clean partings. And they're great when you're doing work that demands a lot of accurate parting. They're great when you're doing updos. They're great when you're doing color. What they're not great for is cutting men's hair because where you have that missing tooth is just like having a broken tooth and you miss all the tension there when you're working with a scissor over comb technique. So they're great combs. I love them. And I use them traditionally when I'm cutting mid-length women's hair that I'm going to be parting and, and holding between my fingers. This comb, the one that Antoinette uses, I love as well. It's a comb that I use when I'm cutting longer hair or chemically processed hair because the teeth on the coarse tooth side are so wide that uh, it's much easier with hair that has a tendency to want to tangle, hair, hair that has a tendency to want to, um, uh, you know, where you need that wider spacing because you are having trouble getting through a comb with, getting through the hair with a standard comb, a standard styling comb. So I love these long hair, highlighted hair, hair that has a tendency to want to uh, continue to be a little bit of a challenge to comb through great comb. But the comb that I use on men exclusively is this comb. And this is the, the Sabon comb. And they're just, they're bulletproof. They used to only come in green. Now they come in, this is the original, the green one. Sassoon's Camp used these. Now they make them in white and they make them in orange. This comb, the thing I love about this comb is that it's got an incredible amount of flex and dexterity, which is important to me. I don't like combs that are too stiff, and I think you're gonna to have to experiment with that. But the other thing that's great about this comb is that it works brilliantly for over comb work because it's got teeth, symmetrical teeth, relatively fine on the core two side all the way to the end. So styling combs, third kind of comb. Third, flat top, clipper comb, styling comb. And then the fourth kind of comb I want to talk about is this comb, and it's a barbering comb. Now, barbering combs are a really precious thing. I mean, this is a very nuanced finishing comb, and you don't use them for large amounts of work because they're hard on your nerves. I mean, you will fall off that skinny little tip of the comb with your cutting tool and make a mark in the haircut. So they're a really good comb um, for the very final part of a haircut when you're getting taking out a little mark a little shadow getting pulling the hair down to clean up the outlines they're an imperative hair comb to have it's just don't think because it's a barbering comb that you're going to use it on a whole man's haircut okay so that's our four kinds of combs i want to show you with every tool i want to talk to you a little bit about some dexterity exercises and that's what i'm hoping you can do while we are all in some isolation. And while I was sitting here preparing for this class, sure enough, um, I was watching Hairbrained, and their quote of the day is, did you practice today? So this is some stuff you can practice, all right? I'm gonna give you, during the course of our conversation here, I'm gonna give you about four or five things that you can practice uh, and you can take it from me, guarantee you the dexterity that you learn from practicing these disciplines, these mechanical exercises, will greatly enhance your fluidity and the quality of your work. Just know that that's true. So with the combs, there's two things I want you to think about practicing. The first thing is simple windmilling. And what windmilling means is being able to spin the comb in one direction, and the other direction. Do it nonstop until you get great dexterity windmilling. And what then put it in your other hand and windmill with your dominant and your non-dominant hand. You 
always want to have that kind of immediate response with your comb to be able to go. The reason that you windmill a comb is so that you can go from the coarse teeth of the comb to the fine teeth of the comb to the coarse teeth of the comb to the fine teeth of the comb. And what happens, particularly when you get into precision haircutting, is the reason that we have coarse teeth on a comb, the reason that Wyas Parks makes a parting tooth is, is so that you can part with the parting tooth and then gather with the fine teeth. It's part with the parting tooth, gather with the fine teeth, part with the parting tooth, gather with the fine teeth. And getting that little motion and just making that kind of part of your cadence in your head is really important. Hold on. I got a, I got a text. I think it's from you guys. Hold on. Uh, here's some questions that are coming in. What are my favorite brands of combs? I'll give, I'll answer those. What's the best comb for curly or textured hair? I'll answer that. And how often do you recommend practicing? You guys, I'm a practicing freak. Um, practice for an hour a day. Everybody practices. Symphony players practice for four hours a day and they're already in the symphony. Practice, practice, practice. Better mechanics make better outcomes, period. My favorite combs, I use a $1.99 wall clipper comb. I have my entire career. It's this one. I love, in, I love the YS Park barbering comb. I use uh, any flat top, flat top comb. I happen to use Andis's again, they're a buck and a half. But how often are you going to use it? You don't need a great flat, flat top comb. Styling, styling, styling are the one, one thing that you want to really want marry. You want to find one, one that you love, you want to buy a dozen of them. You don't want to be changing your tool every time somebody sits down. You want to have a tool for a specific purpose. That's why combs are different. So, um, and I'll get back to some of that in a minute. Let me uh, let me show you the second exercise, and then we'll move on and talk about scissors a little bit. The second exercise I'm going to show you with the clipper comb. All right, windmilling. And believe me, when you watch great people on social media, they know how to windmill their comb. They're they're really good with that finite dexterity. It matters. This. Second exercise is usually referred to as a C grip. And what you do is you put your comb in the in your hand and kind of secure it here. You want to wrap these fingers around it so you're not worried about dropping it. So your ring finger kind of secures the comb. And then you steer it with your index finger and your thumb, with your pointer finger and your thumb. So you want to be able to go 180 degrees with your comb. 180 degrees without ever moving your wrist. It's all fingertip control. My wrist is absolutely stationary and I've got complete dexterity with the comb. Couple of things I want you to think about. You only have to rotate the teeth away from your body. You never have to rotate the teeth back towards your body because there's not hair there. The hair is away from your body. So you go to the ceiling, and to the floor, and to the ceiling, and to the floor. And that, so many brilliant things happen when you do this. The first thing you want to do is sort of a sobriety check, is when you're practicing this, ask yourself, is my pinky out so I can anchor it against the head to find a stability point when I'm working? If your pinky is out, you're probably you know pretty close to having the, the technique right. And then you go to the ceiling and to the floor and to the ceiling and to the floor. That C grip, you use it with every comb when you're with a clipper over comb or a scissor over comb. It's just a, a broad use, non-dominant hand technique. I think it's the most important single technique you can learn. If I was at home doing one thing, it would be going to the ceiling and to the floor. And how they taught you this in barber school was they'd take a ruler and they would masking tape it to your wrist so you were sure that you didn't move your wrist. You were sure that you just did it with your fingers. All right, so those are my two, you understand the combs, those are my two things. Windmill 
both hands, C grip, non-dominant hand. Got it? I'm checking for more questions to see how we're doing. I'm having fun. You guys good? No more questions at the moment. Now I'm going to talk about scissors a little bit. And again, a lot of this is kind of subjective. Different people have a little different opinions, but there's pretty big rules, pretty big sort of overarching rules. With scissors, probably if you were to ask anybody, five and three quarter inch scissor would be the average. Anything shorter than five and three quarters is getting a little shorter. Anything over six inches is getting a little longer. In men's hair cutting, generally scissors are a little bit longer, and that's because in men's hair cutting, we do a lot more scissor over comb work. And what longer scissors give you is they give you a larger workspace. If your scissor is as long as the bar of your comb, you get all that real estate. Where a short scissor, you just don't get as much hair into it when you open and close it. So I'm going to tell you, if you want one scissor and you don't want to switch between scissors, probably six and a half inch scissors are really nice, medium, what we call an all-purpose scissor. You get to seven inches and they get a little bit clumsy when you're doing precision hair cutting. It's just a lot of scissor to work palm to palm with. I use two kinds of scissors. I use usually a six and a half and a five and three quarter. I like a shorter sh scissor when I'm cutting women's hair. I like a, a shorter scissor when I know I'm going to be cutting on the inside of my hand a lot. Those are the only two scissors that I own with a straight blade, five and three quarter and six and a half. What's important is that this side of the scissor you standardize, all right? What you don't want to do is have your muscle memory having to make a totally different grip every time you pick up a scissor. So whether I'm using a long scissor, a short scissor, or a blending scissor, my hand has the same muscle memory. And how you're supposed to do this is open your hand and close it and kind of find where does your thumb naturally fall. Does it fall back a little bit? Does it fall forward a little bit? If it falls back a little bit, or forward a little bit, you probably want parallel poles. If it falls back a little bit, you probably want even more of an offset, offset than this. You, you know, and if you're at a hair show, go to the shear guy and try out everything and find what creates the least resistance in your forearm, all right? So I've got a blending shear, a short shear, and a long shear here. But if you look, they're all exactly the same from the screw on um, into my hand. That That is always going to be, I use scissors with a tang. I use scissors with a mild offset, about a 30 degree offset. And I measure the shank between the, the screw and the finger hole because the longer the shank is, the further your thumb has to swing to open the scissor. So find, do that and just make it a habit. It's just every time you're gonna buy a scissor, bring your favorite, most comfortable scissor with you and look from the screw to the right. Look to what's gonna live in your hand because the blade's gonna determine the characteristics, but the right hand is where you wanna build really good muscle memory. Okay, so that's my scissor deal. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is blending scissors. And I'm not gonna to get too deep into this, but I'll tolerate a little bit of blending shear conversation. Here's what we know about blending shears. Um, the conventional wisdom says that if they have 26 teeth or more, it's a blending shear. It's going to soften the hair and take out weight. Um, it's not going to leave a line of demarcation to mention. It's just going to reduce bulk. If you have less teeth than 26, you're probably going to start to disrupt the haircut cut quite a bit. And how that happened was tra traditional blending shears were all 26, 28 tooth count. 
And then this guy named Irving Rusk, I give him credit for it. This, this hairdresser in the 80s came out with these notching shears. And the goal of the notching shear was to actually disrupt the haircut, to create a really strong channel cut, textured, rough finish to the haircut. And that gave way to a lot of the work Tony and Guy did. It gave away to a lot of the bedhead thing in the 90s. It was those really coarse toothed notching shears. And they're great for what they're built for, but they're not blending shears. They're not softening shears. They're texturizing shears. So you, you don't want to mistake a tooth, you know, a, a jagged tooth scissor as a blending shear especially if you get a tooth count under 24. You're starting to get a different result in the haircut. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about, I have three blending shears. And it's an important thing to know. Um, these two blending shears have 30 and 32 teeth. One of them's made by the Scorm guys, one of them's made by Akari. They're both really high quality. These are the two that I use. And what happens with these that you'll notice is the cutting blade is on the side where the head is. And that, to me, has, has been how I was trained. That's what I use. Now, there are this kind where the cutting blade is where your body is. And they behave totally differently. Um, I find that I just, I don't know that they're a bad scissor. I just wasn't trained with them. And I, I end up working too hard and taking out too much hair with them. Um, so anyway, with blending shears, there's the two things that you want to know. You want to know one, does it got over 20, 26 teeth? And two, can you slide cut with it? Because the really good ones, that's a great technique to be able to close them while you're sliding through the hair. Whereas with the cheaper ones, they're going to rip. So it's an important tool to buy one good one and make sure if, again, if you're at a hair show, take it on the mannequin head, make sure that you can slide as you're closing it without ripping or dragging in the hair. Okay. So now I'm going to show you my favorite, scissor exercises. I'm going to check for questions here. Are we doing good? Oh, again, I got a couple. I'll get back to these. So with scissors, there's two things that I think are, are really the single most important thing with scissors that we all have a challenge with is isolating our thumb. That's the, the key. You've got a stationary blade and a mobile blade. And my favorite exercise I learned in barber school, somebody asked how often do you do it? I still do it all the time. This is something that I have to reinforce my muscle memory with all of the time and it shows in my work. So how they teach you to do this in barber school is you take your scissor and you wrap, you put it you know, on your ring finger and you wrap your first finger all the way to the, your first knuckle over it. All right, so you're actually pulling the shear back towards your heart. It's called the heart grip. So when you, I was in barber school, that's where you would get the callus, would be on your ring finger from pulling the scissor back towards you. And then your thumb never goes through the thumb hole. Your thumb just rests on the outside of the thumb hole. And because if your thumb does go through the thumb hole, you can't open the shear all the way. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. So the heart grip, you're, you're creating tension with the scissor, with your fingers, and then you're pushing away with your thumb a little bit. And what they teach you to do in barber school is you see this, you need to have 90 degrees plus of extension with your thumb. You don't want to be opening and closing your scissor this much because if you do, you're going to make marks in your haircut. Swing your thumb to where you're past 90 degrees. Now the way to do this, the, the brilliant way to do this, and we had to do it to the person who asked how often do you practice? We had to do this for our, our theory in the morning while we were listening to lecture. You 
Let me get, see if I can do this. Take your leg, take your scissor and put it in that heart grip. All right. Then lay your hand backwards on your leg so that you cannot move your fingers. You want your hand to be totally isolated. So the only thing you can move is your thumb. And then open your thumb to about 110 degrees and close it. And what happens is there's only one muscle that's activated when you do that. Can you see that on the screen? And if you're only opening it that far, you're not doing yourself any good. You want to swing it to 110 degrees open and close. So you just do that until it hurts. Do it every day. And you'll never get perfect, but you'll get so much better because this gets into your central nervous system. You learn how to swing your thumb open while keeping your fingers stationary. And then when you turn your hand over, you should be able to swing your thumb without moving your fingers. That's the goal. Good. So that's called the heart grip. You're pulling the, the stationary blade towards your heart, pushing out with your thumb, and you, then you're isolating. And then the second grip, and this is a more common grip, is this. And where you, where you have your finger, instead of pulling the shear towards you, you have your finger right up on the screw. And how this works, I hope you can see with my body, is I'm going to be using the heart grip when I'm working on the bottom half of a haircut with an overcomb technique. I'm going to go to this grip the minute I take a section between my fingers and I'm working to the top. Because if I try and work in the top of the head like this, I've got way too much rotation in my wrist and my elbow is way too high. I can drop my, my elbow and straighten out my wrist when I go to the secondary grip. And those are the only two grips. This one's for overcomb technique. This one's for working on the top of the head. And they both are meant to keep your elbows as low as you can and have the most effective work or use of your tools. Good. So somebody said hi. Somebody else said they're excited. Let me see. Somebody said, love your lip color. I'm sure that wasn't for me. Um, do I have any questions? Are we still good? All right, so two exercises. Heart grip with isolating your thumb, and then I just do this. I go between this grip and this grip, and this grip and this grip. I just do it to make sure that I've got that dexterity down so that I'm always reminding myself to have the right relationship with my scissor while I'm working. So the last thing I want to talk about is clippers. And clippers are a little bit bigger of a conversation because uh, there's, there's just so much more to talk about as far as blade tolerances and ceramic versus steel and, and manufacturer differences. It's, it's, it's a class. It's a really big class. But I do, I can go into kind of... Um, some overs, some big ideas about clippers and, and some mechanics. So the first thing I wanted to say is that there's three different kinds of clippers. There's your stationary fixed bladed clippers, which are edgers. You know, the they, blade does not adjust, nor does it come off. It's just a fixed bladed tool. Most of those are at a triple lot tolerance. Most of those cut about one one hundredth of an inch. Um, the second kind of clipper is what we call an interchangeable bladed clipper where the blades actually come off. And these you have, in order to get a different tolerance, the word tolerance means how long does a clipper blade cut if you hold it right against the skin cutting as short as it can possibly cut. That's the clipper blade tolerance. So the clipper blade tolerance, in order to get different tolerances, you need to buy different blades. And that looks like, that looks like this. There's, you know, I, I travel 
with these nine blades, but I own probably 20 different tolerance blades. Um, and they go from a five aught to arbitrary numbers over three and a half. So why would somebody use an interchangeable bladed clipper? You know, what would the reason for that be? And the simple answer is interchangeable blades, because they are non-adjustable, they can't go out of adjustment. All right, there's every clipper is blade is made with a cutting blade, which is the movable blade, and the fixed blade, or what they call the feeding blade. And that's the one that goes against the head. So how long does a clipper blade cut? What is its tolerance? Well, it has to do with how thick is the feeding blade and how far back is the cutting blade. That's what determines the length of clipper blade cuts. Well, with interchangeable blades, the cutting blade is in a metal groove. It's, it's machined. So they never end up with this blade tilting and cutting somebody. They're really durable. You hardly ever see them with broken or missing teeth. And they're, I like to think about it like photography. You know, a, a camera either has a zoom lens or a fixed lens, a prime lens, they call it. And these are like prime lenses. They, they last forever, they're really durable, they're maintenance-free. I mean, you gotta oil them, but you don't have to adjust them. You're not always having to, to goof with them. And in the old days, and I say the old days, and I mean 10 years ago and further, these were always attached to a motor-driven clipper, which was more powerful. So like the old Oster 76s, they, they were meant for shearing sheep. So you had a, a blade that was really sturdy on a really big motor-driven clipper that had a magneto in it, and it would shear sheep. I mean, it was an actual pet grooming tool that was really powerful. So you, that was important to us in the 90s because we were shampooing every man's hair and cutting off a lot of bulk. Guys were coming in every six weeks, and the, the Oster 76s would just peel through that bulk where a lot of the uh, adjustable bladed clippers would get bogged down and go, wah. So they're great. I mean, I love them. I will always have an interchangeable bladed clipper around. They, they work beautifully. They're, they take a little bit more kind of understanding and a few more pieces, but they're really good clippers, more powerful, don't go out of adjustment. They're, they're beautiful. What I want to say, and I'm going to say this before I talk about adjustable bladed clippers, the thing about clipper blades, this is the key. This is probably, other than the comb grip, this is probably the most important sort of insight that I want to share today. Clipper blades come in either a smooth blade this is a number two blade, and if you can see, it's totally smooth. It's called a smooth blade, okay? This is a fluted blade, and if you look at it, you can see all of those flutes in it, all of those grooves that it has in it, all right? Smooth blade, fluted blade. Well, what happens is the fluted blades, nobody told me this when I was younger, the fluted blades are all beveled so that when you put them on the head, they're beveled to come off and taper. You can see the bevel goes away from the head, okay? Where the smooth blades are beveled to stay on the head, they're beveled towards the head. And they are meant to scrape the head rather than taper off. They're designed differently. If you just hold two of them up in profile, one bends one Here, I'll do it this way. You can see one bends one way and one bends the other. So a lot of times people will grab a thick, smooth blade and try and taper with it, and the blade's lousy at doing that. It's not what they're meant for. With smooth blades, you can also 
at the low tolerance, you can make them cut shorter because these flutes take up some space, right? So any 5 aught blade is going to be smooth because you can't cut down to a 5 aught tolerance and still have flutes. There's just no room for them. But when you're learning to taper, get a fluted blade. I mean, if you have any anxiety about it, the smooth blades just don't like to, to come off the scalp. They're, they're tough. They're, they're harder to use. So that's interchangeable blades. Now I'm going to talk just a little bit about adjustable blades. Then I'm going to talk about blade tolerances. And then you can ask me some questions, okay? So I'm going to say <clears throat> this is an adjustable bladed clipper. The difference between a, a fixed blade clipper and an adjustable bladed clipper is this. It's the armature on the side, and that's what opens and closes the blade. Now, you can get all of this information online, but usually <clears throat> a manufacturer is going to tell you that their adjustable bladed clipper Cuts it about a triple out when it's closed, which is never true, but they'll say that. <clears throat> and about a number one when it's open. That's what the scope of this lever is going to give you. Closed is about a triple out. Open is a, about a number one. I find that they're never a triple out when they're closed. And again, this is a big ass conversation because they have different feeding blades that you can screw on these that give them a different characteristic. But this is just something I can tell you about teaching workshops for a living is um, these are two wall clippers. And this heritage clipper that they made that I love comes out of the factory with a fluted blade. Their wall senior comes with a smooth blade. Can you see the difference? The wall senior cuts way shorter than this 1918 uh, heritage clipper. So people don't know that. They pick up a clipper and they, they just make assumptions about how close they're going to cut. I can do a workshop where people are doing skin fades and I can look around the room and I can tell you what tools they're using by how short their mannequin head is. It's a funny thing. So <clears throat> that's it. You want to be... Uh, and I'm not saying there's a better or a worse. I like wall magic clip clippers. I think wall has got really good cordless technology. I like Andis cordless interchangeable bladed clippers. I think they've got good, good technology as well. And I like cordless clippers across the board now. I mean, the reason I never used to use adjustable bladed clippers was they just weren't that powerful. They are now. They're getting better all the time. So... Um, buy a good one. They're worth it. So smooth blades, fluted blades, interchangeable blades, adjustable blades. Adjustable blades, I didn't, you know, the obvious answer is the interchangeable blades don't need adjustment. Adjustable bladed clippers do. And I used to really not encourage people to have them because I travel around and every time I'd walk into a salon to do a class, someone would open their drawer and pull out a clipper that had broken teeth, that was out of adjustment, that hadn't been oiled, and would make horrible noise when they turn it on. And I'd spend half of my day doing a clipper repair class instead of a clipper cutting class. And <clears throat> not only do they not work when they're out of adjustment, they're dangerous. They cut people because you get cutting blades coming over feeding blades or a tooth missing and you press it against the skin and the cutting blade is gonna cut the skin. So they're fussy, they're still fussy. Um, and if you get one, go on the manufacturer's website and learn how to use it. You know, learn, learn uh, how to maintain it. They've got great videos on all the manufacturer's websites. Keep it oiled, keep it greased, keep it clean. Um, so then the last thing I'm gonna tell you, um, two last things. My idiot-proof way to remember clipper blade tolerances, whether it's a plastic attachment that goes on one of these, you know, whether it's, it's one of these attachments that you put on, 
or whether it's a metal blade that, that you're changing. I got to say a little something about that. But regardless of what it is, within reason, we believe that hair grows a half an inch a month. That means every numerical whole number going up is one week's worth of hair growth. Because a number four blade or a four guard is a half an inch. A two guard is a quarter of an inch and a one guard is an eighth of an inch. So if you believe hair grows a half an inch a month, then you also have to believe that hair grows an eighth of an inch a week. That's a really good way to remember it. Um, the, I used to do this, I'd shave my head with a razor on New Year's Eve as sort of a catharsis. And then I'd take a number one on the 7th of January to see if I could get anything to come off. And it was always just about perfect. The only big difference is going to be, I mean, why is that important? Well, if you've got a guy who gets his hair cut every four weeks and he comes in and says, you know, it got long too fast, you know that going down a whole size in your blade is going to take you down, um, uh, it's going to take you down one week shorter at the base of the haircut where you start at tolerance. So then the last thing I want to say about this, and then this is math. It's kind of, I've been talking for a long time. It's a lot of math for, uh, for 50 minutes into a conversation, but every clipper manufacturer at the small end, the people who make plastic guards for adjustable bladed clippers at the small end, they're going to have 16th of an inch guards. Wall calls there's a half because a one is an eighth of an inch. So a half is a 16th of an inch. And as calls there's a zero. Wall is right. It's a half, right? Wall also makes a one and a half, which is three sixteenths. Why is that important? Well, it's because this armature, this thing on the side of your clipper, doesn't take you a full eighth of an inch. It does take you better than a sixteenth of an inch. So if you're using the sixteenth inch guards, you can cover any length in between with your armature. If you're using the whole number guards, you can't. I hope that makes sense. What I mean is if you cut everything with a three, then you put on a two and open it up, you can't quite hit that length. You need some technique to blend, which I, you should have technique, but it's just mechanically, there's a difference. And again, we'll talk about it when we're together sometime. The last thing I want to say, I hope this is helpful, is that we have four different clipper grips. And we call the first clipper grip the conventional grip. And the conventional grip is when you have your palm on top of the clipper and your thumb on the armature. So left-handed people, your thumb will be across from the armature. Right-handed people, your thumb's going to be on the armature. That's how the clipper manufacturer designed the clipper to be held. That's why they put the armature where they did, because they figured that's where your thumb was going to be. We call that the conventional grip. It is the best grip when you are working horizontally over comb, because it does two things. It keeps the blade of the clipper flat against the comb and it keeps your elbows down and comfortable. The second grip we have is a fanning grip and that's where you put your thumb on top of the clipper. So it's 90 degrees different. That is great for going vertically when you're fanning or taking out lines. It's not the best grip when you're going this way because you got to keep your elbow way in the air. So it's good just to know that, you know, when you go from over calm to finishing, you're going to change your grip from conventional to fanning. That's, that's only makes sense. There's no shame in either one of the grips. And a lot of clippers now actually are putting a little indentation for your thumb on top when you're doing a fanning grip. So the third grip is what we call the pencil grip. And the pencil grip is when you're holding the clipper just like a pencil. And the really the only place that this is applicable in your daily work is going to be when you're doing a flat top. When you're working in zones three and four up high on the head, you're going to want to you're going to want to use this. Now, my problem with this 
is that people that use this pencil grip, there are some times that they're using the pencil grip and I can't do it, but they're trying to cut over foam with the pencil grip and their shoulders are all hunched in and their body's all constricted. And it, it's just, it's a funny thing. It You can't make fun of people because that feels natural. It's just really hard on you. And it doesn't give the, the tools the right alignment. And I, and I used to see that all of the time when you would teach people to cut palm to palm, they'd want to do this instead of do this. And if you see how much more comfortable this is than this, it's hard to believe that someone would fall into that habit, but people do. So the last grip that we do is called a stamping grip. So conventional, fanning, pencil, and stamping. And stamping is exactly the same as fanning, only the clicker is 180 degrees rotated. And you use that for putting in hard lines, the bottom of a sideburn, the outline behind an ear. When I was in barber school, that's where you would get in huge trouble because if the instructor saw you with a stamping grip standing behind somebody, it meant you were blocking a neckline. And they would whistle from across the room and point at you because you were an idiot, right? So just know that you're, when you're aligning yourself, the key is always to have your palms facing your guest. That will guarantee that your elbows are down. So when you're working with a C grip with your scissor, you're always going to find here. You can see my palms, I've got my, my heart grip with my scissor, and I've got my C grip with my comb. Both my palms are facing out, both my elbows are at my side. Obviously, if I've got one hand like this, or one hand like this, something's wrong, right? Palms, elbows down, palms out. Same thing with your clipper. Conventional clipper grip, palms are facing out. Fanning grip, they're not. So that's your that's your magic sort of little sobriety check. Is are my palms facing out when I'm doing any overcomb work, any tool? Okay, so that's it. That's my. Uh, I'm at 53 minutes, and I'm going to check my phone and my questions, um, and see if there's anything I can answer. Cassidy Wilson said, "Great tips. So important to know what tools to use." Um, Dagny Schmidt said, this is good advice. Somebody said, period. Good advice. I'm enjoying all the tips. C grip, C grip, C grip. That's from Bailey Kelly. Um, and should you always have your pinky out? And the answer is yes. You know, you can't always touch down, but you'll never touch down if you don't have your pinky out there looking for a place to touch down. Something else you should never do is have your non-dominant hand not engaged. Um, I always end up seeing people with, when you start, you're scared, right? So you stand too far away from the guy and you got your clipper hand out there and you got your other hand behind your back. You want your dom dominant hand, whether you're combing the hair or brushing the hair or not, you want it on his head, on his shoulder, on your clipper, Keep engaged with both hands. That's the only way you're going to feel the energy coming back to you if they move. And that's the only way you're going to be able to measure how far you are from the head. So, yes, uh, you always want your pinky sticking out. Great tip. So important. So that, I think, this is, you're, you're all saying really sweet things, but I'm not hearing, what tips do you have for men with pro, pro portrayers, I'm sure that's protruding ears. My only tip is don't cut their hair too short. Um, that's a, more about consultation than technique. Um, hold on, oh, they're coming, they're coming, I, I think. Uh, hold on a minute. Are these coming from the bottom up? Um, Oh, so they were coming from the bottom. Let me see. Uh,
Detachable clippers are just the blades. Yes, they're detachable bladed clippers. Um, is there a specific pair of clippers you recommend? You know, if I only had one, um, ultimately you're going to want both a metal bladed interchangeable clipper and an adjustable bladed clipper. I got to tell you, I'm in love with this clipper. It's it. Andis would shoot me for saying so. This is the wall. Um, it's their hundredth anniversary clipper. It's called the 1919. It, it's brilliant. It's got a fluted feeding blade, which I prefer. Um, it's a little gentler to use. It's got a magic weight to it, and it's got incredible battery life. It's powerful. It's durable. It's a great tool. I think um, I just got shipped a box from Babilis of every tool they make. I'm gonna to start to take a look at those. My friends in Europe use them at, at Scorum. Um, but I use a wall adjustable and an Andis Supra for my interchangeable, and they are my favorites because they're both uh, cordless. And uh, yeah, the, the, the Supra too, this is just, this replaced the BGRs, which are great too. Um, and this one, the BGR has a an adapter where you can use a cord or a battery pack. This does not. But there, there, I think that Andis got into the cordless interchangeable bladed clipper earlier than Wall did. And I think they kind of own the market right now. Um, let me see if there's anything else here. And it says, do you, do you feel that adjustable bladed clippers are good for beginners as opposed to guards? I don't think I really understand the questions. Adjustable bladed clippers usually come with guards. I would tell all of you to throw away any guard that's bigger than a one and a half. I mean, if you want to use learn how to cut hair, the twos and the threes really encourage you to follow head shape and cut a carpet on the head. They don't fade. They don't taper. So you end up mirroring too much head shape which i think is kind of the enemy of design so i but that doesn't mean that i don't like blades somebody else asked me earlier about what i do with highly textured hair if you're cutting a lot of highly textured hair then by far use adjustable blades highly textured hair doesn't like a lot of tension so the metal blades create a lot more tension because they got way more teeth i mean if you think about it you got this thing that's got 19 teeth, and you got this thing that's got seven. And with highly textured hair, you don't want to stretch it. You know, you want to cut into it. You don't want to pull it too much because when it pops back, you don't know what you're getting. So I love uh, adjustable bladed clippers. And they're also, when you're doing really, really tight fades, they let you almost airbrush, where you don't get, that's where the adjustment's really, really helpful. Um, and then it says, do you have a preference for your blades? I only use ceramic blades and I only use Andes because Oster blades fit on my equipment, but they are made to spin at a different RPM. So they get really hot. Um, and someone says, do you zero gap your clippers? The answer is hell no, absolutely not. That's don't do it. You know, they come from the man. If you want a shorter blade, get a five aught. That zero gapping is dangerous. You get closer to cutting people. Just trust the manufacturers. Uh, people always do that stuff. Barbers are the worst at hot rotting their gear. You know, they're not, until they cut the shroud off and zero gap them, they're not happy. Don't do that. Uh, how do you hold the shears if you're point using, point cutting. Um, I want, I'm going to answer this as my last question. Uh, I was just in Europe for, for two weeks with the guys at Ruzel. And I'm involved with helping them develop their education program. And I had a really great, a, a really great conversation about what I, it is that I teach. And I think what's really important is that you get really good at the techniques that you're going to use really often 
right? You're going to do clipper over comb work and you're going to isolate your thumb and you're going to have to line up that clipper blade with that comb. You're going to do that forever. Things like point cutting. I mean, this guy Russell says, you know, a guy tilts his head back and you're clipping a hair out of his nose. It doesn't matter what technique you use. Thing, techniques that you're not using all of the time are much less important that you've got good mechanics because you're not going to hurt yourself ad living. It's the basic things that you're going to do, spinning your comb, getting a good C grip, being anchored to the head. Those are the things that are going to take you the furthest. So you guys, I think I've run out of time, but um, thank you for all of your input. And I hope everybody has some good stuff to practice. And I'm going to come back and talk to you another time. Be well, stay safe, and uh, adhere to your social distancing. Bye.